Hello and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. I'm Benjamin Ensel. In this weekly show, we shine a spotlight on the best and the brightest in the tech and financial services industries to try and understand what gets them going, growing, and what they think the future of the industry will look like. On today's Spotlight, I'm delighted to be joined by Bevan Ducasse, CEO and co-founder of YoYo. How are you doing today, Bevan? Very well, Benjamin. Thanks for, for having me. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. So on today's show, we're going to be talking about YoYo and the future of customer loyalty. So let's start off. Can you give us a one-minute elevator pitch for YoYo, please? Great. So, so Benjamin, YoYo is a B2B software as a service company. Um, and as you've mentioned, we specialize in loyalty and rewards. And, and really what we're all about is helping our corporate clients uh, attract new customers, engage those clients better, um, retain slipping customers, and ultimately grow the spend of those consumers in their stores or in their corporate environments. So for people who haven't been paying close attention to YoYo over the past uh, year or two, that might sound a tiny bit unfamiliar. Can you just tell us a little bit about the merger between YoYo and We Group and why you brought those two companies together and you know what the logic behind that was? Sure, sure. So um, I was actually the co-founder of, as you mentioned, Y Group um, in, in 2008. And really, we started this journey in, in Cape Town, South Africa, and we, we focused on, on mobile payments, on customer loyalty and engagement. Uh, and on the other side of the world, there was a business called YoYo Wallet, uh, founded by Michael Rolf and a few others. And uh, they were doing very similar things. Uh, and about two years ago, we had a company called SaltPay that bought into both YoYo Wallet as well as my group. And uh, it was just obvious that we were doing the same things, we were investing in the same products. And we, we just saw the opportunity, Mike Rolf and I got together and said, hey, you know, it's going to make a lot more sense for us to join forces. And we, we formed a single group, YoYo Group, uh, which was the merger of both businesses. And, uh, and ultimately, it just it, it created efficiencies because we were building solutions that made the products better. And then we had some innovations in, in South Africa and globally that, that we were leading. And in certain areas, YoYo Wallet in the UK had, had features that we wanted. So bringing them together we just uh, really catalyst uh, to, to build the business faster and, and have a bigger impact on a, on a global stage. Got it. So you sort of brought the best, the best capabilities of the two companies together and the, and the skills and the people. And presumably you've got a split now between people in South Africa and people in, in the UK. Have you got offices elsewhere or just those two? Yeah, so we, our, our main offices are in London uh, in the UK as well as Cape Town, South Africa. But we do have people in, in Amsterdam, we have people in Kenya, we have people uh, across Europe. Um, so we've got a team all over the world, but those are the two sort of head offices uh, that, that we base ourselves out of. Got it. So let's talk a little bit more about YoYo and, and how you're doing things differently. Um, so as you said, your 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 objectives are to try and you know help um, your your retail customers, your merchant customers attract, engage, um, and, and grow their sort of customer relationships. How do you go about doing that? What's the sort of roadmap for doing that? Yeah, so we've got um, three different products that focus on different areas. So maybe I'll just quickly touch on that. So on the first side, we've got a what we call our retail enterprise product, which is YoYo Pro. Um, a great example of that would be your Cafe Nero app. Uh, and that's where we build white label solutions for, for enterprise clients, typically 50 stores up to about 1,000 stores. And we, we help them build relationships with the consumer. So the consumer will download the application, engage with that. We offer mobile payments, digital gifting, loyalty, order ahead. So a couple of different features within that solution. Um, so that's the one, the one area. We've recently built out an SME product. Um, we, we started off with YoYo Wallet, which is in the hospitality space, um, and, and that's got a big following in the UK. And we've added to that YoYo Go, which is card and loyalty, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. But ultimately, that's a SME focused, and we, we realize that that's a key underserved market. You know, these, these SMEs are needing the same tools that the enterprise clients have and the people like your online sort of giants like Amazon. And so really our vision there and mission is to try and bring all that sort of software and intelligence and bring that to sort of a mom and pop shop that's selling coffee down the road. And so that's the, the vision of what we're doing there. And is that just for, for sort of SMEs in retail or is it intended for SMEs in a number of different industries? Yeah, so it's primarily retail, um, but, but it, you know, retail is quite broad, right? So it could be a hairdresser, it could be a coffee shop, it could be, a, a, you know, a parts a service station, 
So we, we, we're quite open to different areas and we want to service as broad a base as possible. Um, generally, your frequent visits uh, SMEs and retailers is where we're going to be focusing that product. Um, we then do have a third quick product, which is what we call YoYo API, and that's used by big corporates to issue rewards. So people like your Vitality and your banks that want to issue digital gifts and rewards to their consumers can, can do that via YoYo API. So those are sort of the three products and the three different kind of sectors that we service through those products. That's super, super interesting. I'm particularly interested in the, in the last one, the sort of the, the corporate market. Which, which of those three um, sort of business lines is um, sort of growing fastest? Where are, you, where are you finding the most momentum? Yeah, well, it's quite interesting. So over the last few years, we, you know, on the YoYo Pro side, that was sort of the biggest. YoYo API has actually grown quite rapidly over the last 12 months, um, primarily because it's quite platform driven. So as you, you know, we had an mm. example uh, in, in South Africa where we had a client like Vodafone or Vodacom in South Africa, where they hit our API and, you know, within a quarter, we issued 20 million vouchers just through a single integration. So it was quite powerful to see the scale we could get through a solution like that um, in, a, in a very short space of time. But uh, currently, our revenues from YoYo Pro and YoYo API are, are quite equal. It's almost 50-50, and they seem to be growing at a similar rate. Um, but we're very excited about the, the YoYo Grow and the SME product. It's, it's early days, um, but we think that the scale of that could be ginormous. So we, we're excited about all three, and I think time will, time will tell. Which, um, which markets are you, or, or which countries are you, are you promoting in, in I, I realize that you've got operations in a number of African countries. You mentioned uh, Kenya earlier as somewhere where you had some some employees. Which which markets are you active in apart from the UK and South Africa? Yeah, so we're in about 13 different countries. Our primary markets we're focusing on are Europe, UK, um, obviously South Africa, Southern Africa, and Australasia. So we've got clients across all those continents. Um, and our, our primary growth markets now are sort of Europe, UK, and Australasia. I think those are the key. We feel that the, the retail market and the consumer market is, is ripe for this type of software we're building. Um, and we're also working with our um, sort of group company, SaltPay, who obviously owns the majority stake in YoYo. Um, and they're expanding quite rapidly into, into Europe. So we're working with them on how do we leverage their scales. So they're distributing terminals across the European market. And so for us, how do we sort of layer on this cute consumer engagement sort of platform to these SMEs. Uh, and so that's obviously a very key strategic drive that, we, that we're that we going to push as a business. So the company has come a long, long way from the sort of origins of, of, the, of the UK part of YoYo as sort of serving university students on campuses and so on. It's just fantastic to see the success um, that you've had. Tell us a little bit about you. How did you, how did you get into this? What what motivated you to say, hey, here's a really interesting problem I want to get involved in solving? What what motivated you to, 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 to start Y Group and, and get into this? Yeah, so fortunately, I was naive. I was 23 when I quit my job. And, and I think the, the benefit of being young is you, you don't realize how hard it's going to be. <laughs> so, so that was that was good. Um, but really, there was a primary drive around why at that stage, I quit my job and decided to start the business. And for me, there were three things. Uh, the first was, I love this idea of, of getting incredibly talented people that were like minded to build a culture and build a business that we love doing what we what we did. Um, and, it, and it is a bit cliche, but I think it's incredibly important. And I think over the last decade, I've seen it really come to life. And, and that is coming to work and working with a bunch of people that you really enjoy doing work with and doing life with. And, uh, and, and it's enjoyable. And I think that's the most important thing. It's hard. It's, we've had some pretty rough times. Um, mm. But doing it alongside people that I'm really passionate about is, is just incredible. And I think that was my, my sort of one big drive. And then the other one was the idea that we could build solutions and, and impact millions of people's lives. You know, technology afforded us the opportunity to build something and, and scale it, you know, and, and that excited me. This, this idea that we could come up with solutions that add a tremendous value to, you know, to the world. Um, and, and ultimately that's what kind of catalysted the idea to say, let's, let's do this. It's interesting. You've, you've sort of talked about youth, your own youth when you started and so on. How, how important is, is that? Are you finding that um, you're seeing younger customers with, with very different expectations? Are you finding that younger customers are maybe more open to some of these offers and rewards? Are you finding there's a, any generational differences in, in, in terms of 
customer adoption, consumer adoption? Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether I'm now considered young still or, or not. <laughs> That's a question. I remember when I started, uh, you know, we, we obviously ultimately had a very young team. And, uh, and as we got older, I suddenly realized that now our sort of average executive age will be sort of 37 to 42. And, you know, we still young, but we're not, we're not as young as we were. So I guess it's, it's interesting. But I think that there's a universal truth around what people are looking for. And, and for me, that, that really does jump across generations. And that's what I love about it. And, and really what that focuses on is this idea that everybody wants value, right? If they're buying something of value, they, they, they see a value in that thing that they're purchasing or that experience. And that's, you know, across generations. But more importantly, what people want is simplicity and friction, frictionless ability to get that value. And that's also maybe your, your younger generations adopt it quicker, but they're certainly not exclusive to that. And we're seeing with e-com um, as a great example, you know, we were, we were always saying, well, e-com is going to be adopted by the younger, by the youth generations. And, and perhaps it was, but I mean, you, you know, we're seeing with, even with this pandemic, that, that just every single household, no matter what age, they're clicking an app and they're getting their groceries delivered in 60 minutes or their, their Amazon, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, you, you arrive at the store and I'm seeing, you know, 60 year olds scan a QR code and, and place an order. Um, so I think this drive, the pandemic has, has fast tracked that, but certainly it's, it's multi generational. I think that every generation now is realizing that actually there's convenience of software and that's the value. It's not, it's not exclusively available to 20 to 30 year olds. It's convenience and value and simplicity and frictionlessness is everyone wants that. Uh, and that's exciting. Yeah, definitely. I've, you, you you started talking about the pandemic there, and I, I, you know it's super interesting how that has accelerated digital adoption in in so many fields. Um, have you seen what have you seen at YoYo? I mean, you, you obviously talked about it a little bit already, but did you did you see sudden changes in customer behaviour? And obviously, for some of your some of your merchant partners, they were predominantly in store. You know, if you're a coffee chain, pandemic wasn't good for you, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so we, Benjamin, exactly right. I mean, the first thing I'll say is we've seen a massive acceleration in adoption of certain software, which we'll touch on. Uh, but we also saw the crumbling of some of the solutions. So as you say, a lot of our in-store solutions where people were paying over counter with the mobile app, um, that just came to a grinding halt. And we had a few months where we had, you know, zero transactions with closed stores. So that was, that was quite difficult to get through. And, and obviously it, it, it impacted our revenue because we had a lot of in-store transactions that just disappeared overnight um, across the world. So that was the other thing, yeah. just a regional challenge. It was a global challenge. Um, so, so that was interesting in watching, you know, the UK happen and then we see South Africa happen and see the Netherlands happen. And it was just in every market, which was, I think, one of the first. Um, but then on the other side, we saw things like order ahead and uh, pay a table start just taking off. Mm-hmm. So we, where we saw, unfortunately, most of our volume was over counter. So we saw a big dip there, but we did see the, the opportunity to scale things like order ahead and pay a table, um, which, which we had in certain environments. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have an SME product ready for that. And I think there we saw massive adoption. Um, but it's, it's just been great. I think for in general, for technical adoption, you know, for people to say, Hey, let me, it forces people to try these things. I mean, delivery to home is another one that. I think a lot of people weren't trying and, uh, and, and they tried because they were locked up at home and they didn't really have as many options. Um, so I think it's been very good for the industry as a whole. And for, for you as a company, were you able to sort of develop new solutions? I mean, how quickly were you able to react to those sort of changes in, in, the, in frankly, in the, econo- in the whole economy and how people were buying and, and getting food? Yeah. Look, I think in certain areas we, we adopted and we evolved quite quickly. So we launched one or two things maybe in sort of three to six months. Obviously, in certain cases, we missed that first big wave, you know, in your first hard lockdown. We, we weren't able to deliver something in that period. And so I think the guys that had really had solutions that served that need got quite, I and mean, I was talking to a couple of founders that, for example, were offering a, a pay at table in SMEs. Um, and, and their, their phones were ringing off the hook quite quickly. Yeah. Um, we had paid a table, but we had them in a couple of enterprises that were really integrated and takes a long project to get that live. Um, so we saw good adoption, but it wasn't, for example, signing up a thousand SMEs a week. Uh, you know, so I think a combination in certain cases, we, we realized we probably missed the boat and we could have been quicker. And in other places, we, we were up the picking. So it was, 
both both good and bad. You talked a little bit earlier about sort of APIs and and trying to build out your products as APIs and so on. How how important is that to to your sort of strategy and your business model? Being able to sort of scale quickly. Has, has, have you have you changed the way you sort of deliver? I mean, you said you started as sort of software as a service already, but have you changed how you deliver to your customers at all? Yeah, we've had a very interesting journey um, with with APIs. Uh, you know, we we actually a couple of years back in in Y Group, we tried to expose APIs to all of our services, and and what we found is it actually got too complex and too noisy. You know, it's 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 like you had a subscriber service and a loyalty service and a gift service and and we realized that people wanted something a little bit more packaged. So we kind of went to the one extreme of complete microservices to everything. And it was very diff- difficult for people to understand what it was. So we, we then sort of stripped that down and Yo-Yo API specifically, this product is, is purely just a gifts and reward API. Very simple to understand. People that want to reward or incentivize can trigger this API, issue a digital gift card, and it's, and it's very clean and easy. So that, so I think the lessons that we learned there is, there's there's a massive use case for API, and as I used that example earlier, someone can integrate to us and they can trigger a reward to 20 million customers, and we get huge scale. So it's almost like platform as a service. You know, they can build on top of it as well. Um, and and on the other extreme is if you if you're not focused enough and you just you know open up so many different APIs, it's very difficult to to you know sell what you have and and communicate the value to people. So. Mm. Um, for example, Yo-Yo Pro and Yo-Yo Go are not APIs. Those are packaged products because we felt in that market they don't want you know, 25 different APIs. Cafe Nero wanted a white label app that did everything and did everything really well, as, a, as an example. And if I just exposed 25 APIs to them and they had some agency build an app, it would come out maybe not as good as what we could have packaged it. So I think those are examples of a packaged solution versus certain environments where APIs work very well. That's that's super super interesting, and I, I I think a lot of people watching this will be in businesses that are having similar sort of challenges of what's the right balance of packaging versus APIs versus um, other other approaches. And is no and what I've learned is there's no there's no sort of perfect answer, and that's the that's the point. You know, on the one hand, you say everything should be APIs, and and I agree to a certain point, um, but but other areas you need to package them. And obviously, your customers are at different levels of sophistication. So, what some of them need and what others want is not necessarily the same. I mean, an SME is another great example of that, right? And there's no way an SME is going to understand an API and build up their own solution and build an app or a mobile site or a loyalty. They need a complete packaged, one click SaaS solution. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about loyalty because we've we've we've, you know, we've been talking for a while. We haven't really gone into loyalty at all. Um, you you. A lot of what you're doing is rewards. Rewards and loyalty are not the same thing. And I think sometimes people sort of mistake rewards for loyalty. It's not quite the same thing. Um, how are you helping the, the merchants and your, your customers really earn, earn loyalty? Rather, you know, rewarding customers is good, but how do you measure that? How do you see whether that's really driving loyalty? Can you give us a little bit of a, tell us a little bit about the sort of results that you're able to help your, your customers, sorry, your merchant to the customers achieve? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this this sort of philosophy is across you know enterprise SME as well as corporates and and really we break it up into four buckets. So on the one hand we say how do we help you attract new customers? So how do you spend money to get them? Whether it's providing them with an offer or referral campaigns, um, and ultimately there's an ROI, a return on investment to that. And so through our portal and our engaged portals we can create campaigns to drive new customers into the store. Then we have an engaged area which is quite difficult to prove an ROI on, but ultimately they want to engage customers better both ways, right? So the, the communicating out, but also getting feedback back from consumers to say, you know, what are what are consumers wanting? And I think they we can't put an ROI on that feedback, but we know how important that feedback mm-hmm. is to better your product, better your service, understand the needs of consumers. So there's a really strong need and desire for that feedback. And then the other two key areas where we do put an ROI on is, is the retention of customers so what we can track is if you have a potency uh, as benjamin to shop three times a month at a specific store and we see that you start slipping down to one we can see that you're a slipping customer so we can try and create some temp- campaigns to say hey, maybe come in three times this month and earn, earn something different and and that drives your behavior to get you back in and you know, out of that slipping state and or a churn state if you're a churn customer you haven't back in you, you might really like the store, but you've forgotten about it. And so how do we get you back in and bring you front of mind? And there, there's a very clear ROI to get you back. 
And then the final one is how do we grow customer spend? So we've attracted, we've engaged, we've retained, and then ultimately, is there a way for us to grow spend? And that might be serving you the right product on your ordering checkout. Um, it might be you know, increasing your basket size, offering you another product when you're checking out, um, and it might be increasing your frequency. And that's those are the different areas we are able to grow spend. And ultimately, there's an, a return on investment um, that we can calculate for these retailers. What, what do they pay us? What do they give as a reward? And ultimately, what's their return on investment? Um, if they can grow the lifetime value of their customers, um, it's it's fairly easy to start determining the, the return. So that's very interesting. It sounds like you've got some really strong metrics that you're able to share with your retail customers to really help them understand what difference it's making. Um, loyalty can be emotional rather than rational. You know, from a consumer standpoint, the, 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 the brands that I'm loyal to are not necessarily, you know, um, the ones that provide me with the best products or the, even sometimes the best service. Um, ha have you found ways to sort of help your customers create positive experiences, sort of positive customer experiences and really create that kind of emotional loyalty? Are, are there certain interactions that some of your merchants are delivering that you can see have a bit more of an effect? I realize it's hard to measure some of this stuff. Sure. But... sure. Well, I think firstly what I'll say to you is you, you're 100% right. So I think there's two things to talk about with loyalty. Is, uh, I'll touch on the one, is, which is firstly the product and the service needs to be great. People you know, think loyalty might be a silver bullet to cover up bad service and product, and, and it's just definitely not right. So, so we, we're not the silver bullet that's going to solve a bad product and a bad service that's not meeting a need. <laughs> Um, so I think that that fundamentally is what people need to get right at a starting point. Then software and loyalty and rewards is a, is a extension of that and something that can create something you know even better for them. So then when you talk about brand identity, again loyalty and applications and engagement, it's the same as social media. It's an extension of something that you're already living. So whether it's a Cafe Nero, um, we have a a uh, client in South Africa called Vida that's very brand um, driven. You know, they, they, they try and create this sort of culture around coffee and I think very similar to Cafe Nero. And so then the application and the communication and the articles in the application need to enforce and reinforce the fact that they want to have an authentic relationship with consumers. They want the consumer to have this experience in the store, not just enjoy the coffee, but actually feel that there's a vibe and a community that they can be part of. And so then the software needs to how does it support that narrative? And it is about narrative. It's you know, and and again, it's about an omni-channel narrative. They need to have the same feeling in their tone in social media that they do in the application that they do in their store. And if that tone is not consistent, it's just, it's going to feel back very quickly. Um, you know, they they might have a social media person that's got a specific tone, and then their stores are just on a different planet. So that's where that sort of omni-channel and that and that experience layer needs to be consistent across all of those areas. We've talked quite a lot about the the retail experience in the in the last sort of um, fifteen minutes or so. Can we can we talk a little bit about the corporate work that you're doing? Because I was super interested by that. Because you know we have seen sort of big companies really thinking hard about how to look after their employees, particularly as a result of the pandemic. There's a more of a focus on sort of employee well being and mental health mental health and so on for employees. Can you tell us a little bit about that side of the business? Yeah, so I think that really focuses in on the, the Yo-Yo API product and, and it has been quite remarkable. So I'll just touch on a few um, examples of what people have done to use the API um, because we don't necessarily build up the stream and that's the example of we don't have the full end-to-end -end package solution because there's just so many use cases for the API and that's where the example of the API is more powerful than the package. So, so what we've done there, um, a, a great exa example of this is Discovery Vitality. And, and they started out actually in South Africa, mm -hmm. they've now exported that globally. Um, but the idea of people going for a run and syncing their Apple Watch and their Garmin to Strava and to Discovery app. And if you accumulate a certain amount of calories or heart rate for a certain period of time, you get instant rewards. And those rewards were triggered through our API. So if you've got an instant smoothie for going for a run or a coffee, you know, at, at, Neuro or whatever it might be, those are all triggered through Yo API. Uh, and so it was a wonderful place where they were kind of building out the intelligence of who to reward for what, because obviously every company has got a different reason for it, which is why we stayed out of that. But what they needed is a simple reward API to issue a reward to digital channel instantly for that customer to go anywhere in multiple countries and go and scan their phone and pick up a free smoothie uh, as, as an example. 
And so that was a wonderful kind of partnership that we saw come to life, but a great example of how they were really driving wellness and, and behavior driven by rewards. And it was incredible. And we were doing hundreds of thousands of smoothies and coffees every week um, just through changing that people wanting to change behavior because of that reward. So, so that was an incredible one. And then we've seen, you know, people like banks incentivize people to spend more. Or we've seen guys incentivize staff with staff payouts. So they say, you know, on a monthly basis, if you achieve your OKRs, we're going to trigger a digital gift card to you. So we just, it's, it's amazing how all these different opportunities are coming out of the woodwork by us just exposing this easy reward API. Um, and, and there really are countless ways in which people want to reward, whether it's staff incentives, rewards, changing customer behavior, repayments of a loan, uh, Vodacom are incentivizing people to buy data. So there's, again, a myriad of options as to why it can be used. It's the wonderful thing about innovation is the sort of unintended consequences. You build something and someone else starts building something on it and using it in a way you didn't anticipate and expect. And suddenly you have this whole new That's new exactly thing. it. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I really want a smoothie now. And um, this whole conversation about smoothies is making me, you know, just really, really want a smoothie. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned um, Discovery Vitality, which is obviously a, has been a huge example to, to many people, obviously, particularly in the insurance industry, but a great example of loyalty. Um, are there uh, other companies in the loyalty industry that you sort of admire and look at? Uh, you know, there are one or two others where you say, you know, that company, you know, in any industry where you say, you know, that, those guys doing a really good job on loyalty. They're really interesting for us. Yeah, yeah. So, so look, I think there are, there, there, there are a couple. I mean, it's hard for me to iron out one, but I mean, I think there's a couple of airline industries which we've known have done incredibly well in loyalty because they've they've changed it from just being rewards, but also to being mm. like, there's almost like an element of service. You know, if you, if you, if you get a priority this or you can get to a lounge or, you know, it, it's been, a, it changes people's behavior. And I think we've seen it. And that's an example of, I think, people doing it really, really well. Um, I do think in the QSR space, you know, people like Nero have done a great job on saying, how do I, how do I really think about what my customers want? Um, so, so, so they've been good. And then I think in a whole different world, there's, there's, um, programs that, that we've seen that are omni retail that are also quite interesting. Um, and what we're seeing a shift to is this idea of social good. So I think there's mm-hmm. going to be a shift now from, um, and I've actually been exploring this with our team recently. Is how do I build a solution that not only incentivizes a free coffee, but potentially, you know, I'm actually all my payments, I'm giving 1% back to social good. And I think there's a huge, especially with this pandemic again, that for me, you know, I'm probably more interested. Most people that can afford a coffee and a sandwich can afford to give a coffee and a sandwich. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, I'm quite excited to see that shift in, in goodwill from, Hey, what do I get back to what can I give back on every one of my transactions? So I think. Um, that's maybe not answering your question around who. There's some examples of that, but I think it's it's something that I think is coming. And and one of the product innovations that we've recently done is what we call card link loyalty, um, which people pay with a bank card or pay with Apple Pay and automatically earn loyalty. And it's something we've worked on for the last 18 months. And really the idea behind that is, you know, as mentioned earlier, we want to drive convenience, simplicity, and frictionless transacting. People want rewards but they don't want to jump through hoops to get those rewards. Mm-hmm. So that's where we've innovated and said, you know, people, I want to walk in and just pay with Apple Pay. I don't want to have to go and find an app and open it up. So, so that's been our sort of most recent innovation, which is really exciting. And then if you tie that into the opportunity to either get a free coffee or a free meal or whatever after transacting a few times, to maybe I'm contributing to this global cause on every transaction, it, it's got a very interesting tweak to that narrative. I think that's super, super interesting, the sort of emergence of more purpose-driven brands and the importance that many customers are putting on, thinking about who they're doing business with and, and so on. Super, super interesting. We're coming to the end, towards the end of the show. So we want to finish off with a, sort of a, a, a couple of last questions. Um, so one last question, and you can answer this however you like, related to fintech or not. What advice would you give to your younger self? What do you kind of wish you'd known 10 years ago or what would you say to your your younger self so i think for me the the, the biggest lesson is probably it, it takes the same amount of energy um to to build a solution that's got a low scale opportunity than it does to to think about and build a solution that's got ul- sort of ultra scale ability so what i mean by that is when i was younger 
I'd come up with an idea and I'd say, hey, this could impact whatever, you know, a thousand stores and, and it could generate X thousand dollars a month. And I was like, that's a great opportunity. And I'd run with it. But what I didn't realize is if I just paused a bit longer and I'd spent a little bit more time refining that thought process and actually maybe thinking a little bit bigger and saying, so you can spend the same amount of time and energy, but actually conceptualize something that's just got a far bigger scale opportunity. And I think the lesson for me, you know, that I've learned over the years is the opportunities are there, whether you've had 12 years experience or one year experience, it doesn't limit you from being able to have an impact in tens of millions of people's lives. You don't have to wait a decade before you can have that impact. You can come up with solutions you know, as a 23 year old, 24 year old that, that can have that impact. So I think it's just the limitation we place on ourselves to say, hey, I need to start with this and learn and then I can get bigger. Um, and, and sort of going to my 23 year old, 24 year old and saying, hey, you know, you can actually make an impact on 100 million people's lives in a year's time. Right? And that just sort of would have blown my mind at that stage. Yeah. I mean, I think you have had an impact on a lot of people's lives already, but um, <laughs> Thanks, but, but fantastic. Okay. So just before we finish off, um, what's next for YoYo? I mean, you've talked about it a little bit as we've talked already, but um, any any big things coming? Anything um, you think uh, people should hear about what's next for YoYo? Yeah. I think the biggest one I just touched on earlier is, is certainly card link loyalty. You know, I think there's going to be this massive swing towards people paying however they want to pay, as mentioned earlier, Apple Pay, Google Pay with their card. And us tapping onto that and identifying the customer in the background. And I just think it's such a beautiful and seamless, frictionless experience. And so I think that's the thing. It's, it's new. We, we, we did launch it about nine months ago, but we've been sort of in pockets and isolation. So I think there's going to be a massive swing towards still rewarding and still engaging customers, but in a far simpler way. I mean, I'd love to see a world where people no longer have a loyalty card and people no longer have to jump through hoops. And I think we all want that, right? We all like the idea of being rewarded and, and being valued. But we just can't stand the extra hassle. So that, that for me is a mission of ours. And, and I'd say ultimately the summary of it all is, you know, we want to reach a hundred million customers and, uh, and we want to give them the world's most rewarding buying experience. And that's, that's what we want to, what we want to chase down. That's super interesting. We, we talk at, at 11FS, we talk a lot about invisible payments. You're sort of talking about invisible loyalty and rewards. It's mm-hmm. so easy. You don't have to think about it. It just happens right. and, and rewards you and encourages you. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, everybody. So we're, we're coming to the end of the show, which is a shame because I'm loving this conversation. But um, I want to say a huge thank you uh, to you, Bevan, for, for, for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and everything that you're getting up to? Yeah, well, thank you, Benjamin. It's been, it's been great to be on the show with you. And thanks for the, the conversation. Um, yeah, I think the easiest is just to go on to yoyogroup.com, uh, have a look at our website, see the different products and solutions we offer. And uh, it also links to our social media pages so you can keep up to date with some of the innovations and the things we're doing and our culture. Um, so I'd encourage you to go there. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. So that's all that we have time for for this week. Uh, please make sure that you follow 11FS on LinkedIn so you never miss an episode. And go visit the 11FS YouTube channel where you can catch up on previous episodes of Spotlight. And of course, if you're watching this in the future, future episodes. Um, So thank you so much, Bevan. Have a great week, everyone, and goodbye.